Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tiffany. Thank you to everybody involved in um, making this happen today, and to the audience for coming. My paper focuses on project exhibitions and the new types of publics that project exhibitions generate. I show that this new form of exhibition making mobilizes an array of innovative display techniques to engage spectators, to generate a strong sense of belonging to a meaningful enterprise among artists, and to encourage the carryover of knowledge developed in the art shows to other contexts. Project exhibitions combine curatorial, artistic, and discursive practices to establish relationships between artists, publics, communities, and institutions. They feature dense assemblages of heterogeneous materials and media with specific community-directed aims and outcomes. They cultivate a critical public sphere. My argument is that project exhibitions have the potential to transform the function of art museums in the new millennium. The phenomenon of project exhibitions developed amid the remarkable array of innovative artistic practices and exhibition formats and display sites that were critical to art's transformation in the late 20th century. These exhibitions sought to open up art spaces for non-art publics, collectively produce new knowledge sites, enable the self-representation of social groups hitherto represented by others, mobilize museums and galleries for theme-related discussions, and establish transdisciplinary networks that could be active and productive in areas of society beyond the established institutional context. The novel methods they introduced mostly took the form of meta-reflections on art's presentational apparatus and limits. The exhibition sites included um, public streets and private apartments, lounge bars and cinemas, and other unconventional venues. The new techniques made extensive exhibition brochures, didactic wall texts, open forums and research-based publications commonplace, and altered manners of displaying artworks, guiding visitors through shows, and educating viewers. In the United States, Locally based project exhibitions such as Group Materials AIDS Timeline of 1989 to 91, which reflected on the inaugural pandemic of the neoliberal era, and artist Martha Rosler's If You Lived Here, also of 1989, which examined processes of gentrification and homelessness, codified the new display practices that come to be known as project exhibitions. Group Material first exhibited the AIDS timeline at the Berkeley Art Museum in California, and then at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut in 1990, and at the Whitney Biennial in New York City the following year. AIDS timeline integrated media accounts of US health policy and recent developments in medical research. It also highlighted actions by the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, commonly known by its acronym ACT UP, a grassroots political group working to end the AIDS pandemic. Visual materials such as reproductions of artworks, photographs, F protest marches, posters, and other graphic design accompanied text collages presenting perspectives of the health crisis. The Dia Art Foundation commissioned Martha Rosler's If You Lived Here and installed it in three successive exhibitions on the subject of urban planning and exclusion at its Soho Gallery space in Manhattan. Rather than present singular art objects, If You Lived Here reflected on the relation between art production and social contexts. Martha Rosler used the DIA galleries specifically not to produce new representations of homelessness in the tradition of art forms such as social critical photography, opening them up instead for self-help groups, critical planners, and artistic projects. Designed to resemble the domestic interior of a small New York City apartment, the show's prevalent themes focused on the structural dynamics of real estate speculation privatization, and displacement. If You Lived Here featured prints, photographs, 
planning documents, architectural models, advertising propaganda, videotapes playing on monitors, film screenings, and activist campaign materials pertaining to contemporary housing struggles in New York City. Rosler also programmed public talks and panel discussions and assembled a reading room with a broad array of materials. The exhibition examined the politics and processes of homelessness, which was particularly relevant given that the gallery was located in an area of Manhattan where an expulsion policy had been undertaken in conjunction with the district's increasing gentrification. The exhibition also assigned its public a new role. Within the framework of a wide variety of accompanying texts, it situated spectators as either long-term local residents struggling with gentrification, middle-class residents attempting to move into the neighborhood, artists who had their studios there and were thereby implicated in the social conflicts, or entirely distant observers learning about the situation's complex intricacies. Both AIDS Timeline um, and If You Lived Here opened the art space for debates and groups and themes that had previously had no access there and cooperatively shaped the content with them. They constructed counter-hegemonic forms of making exhibitions uh, and receiving artistic production. The display modes they developed extended socially engaged art practices beyond a critique of cultural institutions and into a broader public commons. Project exhibitions typically deploy research, documents, workshops, panel discussions, curated screenings, and reading rooms to produce knowledge. They de-emphasize aesthetic subjectivity's uniqueness and disavow conventional art exhibitions' tendency to construct spectators as potential com consumers. Featuring dense assemblages of heterogeneous materials and media with specific community-directed aims and outcomes instead. They are enunciations in action, bringing together distinct elements and publics in the form of events that generate ephemeral experiences. These shows function as process-based, collaborative, transdisciplinary, non-hierarchical, gender-conscious, and generative modes of exhibition making, explains art critic Tom Holert. They are more about enabling a becoming and creating a counter-public than about displaying knowledge in a representational mode. In this manner, Project exhibitions convert contemporary art into what Marian van Osten, one of the primary theorists of this form of exhibition making, calls a space for the desire for new subjectivities, a fertile ground for new possibilities. While the particular techniques used by artists who made project exhibitions in the 1990s may have differed, the complicated relationship these practitioners acknowledged between history, theory, and artistic productions united them. Reflecting on this interconnection was also central to German artists, um, Alisa Kreischer and uh, Andreas Siegmann. Together with Birger Hubel and Dirk Schmidt, the artists organized a large project exhibition, Messe to OK, T Talking Economics, in Cologne in 1995, which tried to understand the economic shift capitalism's systemic deepening had brought upon the arts in the 1990s. Kreischer and the others coordinated the event to coincide with the Cologne Art Fair, which at that time was billed as the world's first contemporary art fair when it launched uh, in 1967. By the 1990s, the organizers of this annual art fair had set aside all pretense and ritual and were then directly recruiting arts and consumers. Mesa 2 OK's goal was to counter these increasingly instrumental conditions. It provided a meeting place for socially engaged artists and critics and others concerned with the art market's growing dominance over culture. It favored collaboration and partnerships the coordinators and artists involved focused on the various ways art's brazen mercantilization overlapped with transformations in the public sphere. A sense of purpose and determination offset the artist's recognition of art's economic realities. 
When finally staged in November 1995, the counterfair was in a large empty building block opposite, directly opposite the Cologne Art Fair. The post-industrial edifice had long belonged to the, post, to the Bonn Post, uh, the rail-based mail delivery service in Germany, West Germany, but the public corporation had recently sold it to a private entity. Approximately 30 artists' groups from across Europe participated in the show. None of the featured artworks were for sale. Exhibition booths were conspicuously absent, and there were few objects that the uninitiated viewer would immediately identify as artworks. According to the organizers, their goal was to realize a non-hierarchical space, to develop a structure that was transparent and democratic, anti-administrative, informal, and extremely subjective. The event had three main platforms, project-oriented art, electronic music, and political philosophy. It ran for four consecutive days. The organizers constructed semi-portable art booths so that the exhibits could move from one place to another in the enormous building every day. The day's content, which varied from urban development to the vicissitudes of left aesthetics and collective artistic practices, determined the booth's movement. As a result, the show's layout was perpetually in flux, transforming from one day to the next. For Kreischer, Siegmann, Hubel, and Schmidt, this was an important conceptual element. It showed that the issues raised by the exhibited artworks could take multiple forms during the show's run, and that spectators could contemplate the art and the exhibition from various different perspectives. In the early 2000s, Kreischer and Siegmann worked on several more project-based exhibitions, developing further this artistic form of display. In 2006, um, they traveled to Potosi, uh, a city in the southern highlands of Bolivia. With co-curator Max Hinder, they returned to Bolivia in 2008 and studied pictures created in Andean mining sites under Spanish rule. The investigations resulted in the 2010-2011 project exhibition Potosi Principle, which explored global capitalism's callous dynamics from the surprising perspective of the Spanish colonial empire and its distinctive imagery. Initially installed in Madrid in 2010, and then traveling to Berlin and La Paz, Bolivia, this show worked across the institutionally defined and often rigorously guarded boundaries between curatorial practice, aesthetic expression, and scholarly research. Its thematic elements related the violent conquest of the Andes to global capitalism's callous dynamic in the 21st century. The curators presented primitive accumulation, defined as the willful destruction of a population's sustenance patterns to generate dependence on low-paid and often dangerous labor for economic survival, as a key capitalist principle that facilitated the exploitation of the Americans by the European economy. They overlapped primitive accumulation with another meaning of the word principle, uh, that is origin, to elaborate a genealogy that linked the framework of the European world system and a specific model of power since the 16th century to, sent to essential features of neoliberal globalization and contemporary art. Kreischer, Siegmann, and Hinder invited artists from Bolivia, Argentina, Spain, China, Russia, England, and Germany to address a carefully selected array of Andean Baroque colonial paintings, prints, codices, and books that they deemed historical evidence. They called on the artists to probe these cultural texts for the way they mediate colonial ideology. As a result, the artists responded with installations of photographs and, and data on liquid crystal display monitors and film and video projections, newly painted canvases, printed material, and performances. They forged their works at the fissures of temporal difference, at the margins between fundamentally incommensurate cultures. The curators also organized the project exhibition as a way that sought to recover the museum's role as an educational institution and constituent part of the public sphere. They used the curatorial process, installation techniques, programmed live events, 
and accompanying catalog to question how the show addressed its themes and established its relationship with spectators. They sidestepped traditional object-oriented curatorial practice to ask how the exhibition might open history to subjective knowledge, subject to subjugated knowledge and alternative interpretations. Instead of organizing a conventional display of objects on the museum walls and on the museum's walls and floor, the curators experimented with figures of framing and viewpoint. They developed innovative exposition techniques and narratives to foster a new perspective of the colonial encounter and its legacy. The methods included novel ways of arranging and presenting objects and relaying information, addressing, assembling, guiding visitors through the gallery display, and interacting with the materials presented. The Potosi principle merged history and place, discourse and design, the performative and the reflective. Against the Western framework's standard curatorial protocols, Kreischer, Hinderer, and Siegmann paid as much attention to the politics of display as to the display of politics. The show generated cons a considerable uh, critical response, and reiterations of its archive continue to be exhibited to this day. In fact, uh, the uh, most recent reiteration of the Potosi Principle archive is currently on display in New York's Institute for Studies of Latin American Art in Tribeca today. A growing number of artists and curators have developed the legacy of the project exhibition in the 21st century. Allow me to conclude this brief overview by focusing on a recent iteration of this mode of exhibition practice. The show Retro Future Notes for a Collection is currently on view in Rome's Macro Museum of Contemporary Art of Rome. Curated by Luca, Luca Lopinto, the museum's current director, the exhibition functions like a palimpsest in space, overlaying different temporalities to reflect on the role of a public collection of contemporary art in the 21st century. It features the city's museum's collection, which is stored in its basement. Macro was founded in 2001 when Rome's municipal gallery of 1,200 works from its collection were moved to the newly renovated site of the former Peroni Brewery building. Normally off limits and publicly inaccessible, Lopinto commissioned photographer Giovanna Silva to interpret the collection by photographing the collection as she wished. He then teamed up with Silva to print the black and white photographs of the collection in large scale and affix them to the walls of the gallery space. The ensuing photo murals entirely covered the walls of the gallery, as you can see in this slide. Titled Katabasi, after the ancient Greek word to, to, to describe the descent into the underworld, Silva's floor-to-ceiling photo mural montages presented Macro's inaccessible subterranean collection in new configurations. The photographer juxtaposed blown-up images of seldom-seen works to some of the collection's highlights. Lopinto, in turn, used Silva's photographs as a backdrop and context for the steady insertion of artworks by young Italian artists in the gallery space over the span of four years. As I said, it continues today. He commissioned the artists to either produce new works or to situate existing artworks in the context developed by Silva's blow-ups. Accordingly, the artists installed their interventions in Retro Future in dialogue with the pictured works from the collection or those inserted by their contemporary peers previously commissioned by Lopinto. The latter's goal in curating the project exhibition was thus to provide a context and a space for artists from a generation not yet represented in museums to locate their practice in relation to their predecessors in the museum's collection and to recently commissioned contemporaries. In the project exhibition's first iteration, Lopinto juxtaposed a sound element, cult rave and techno musician Lori D's 1991 track, The Sounds of Rome, to Silva's Catabasi. Each month following this initial juxtaposition, another artist was added, another artist was asked to add their work to the show. One of the earliest interventions was by Beatrice Marchi who projected her five-minute, 35-second surrealistic video, Story of a Girl Band, 
onto the gallery floor in a loop. The video ludically transforms a group of characters ostensibly in transit. Here's the video, shot of the video here. A group of characters ostensibly in transit on a moving, wa on a moving walkway at an airport into an all-female pop band. The figures are hybrid. They're simultaneously humans and animals, young and old, women and men. The video depicts their meaning, that, that depicts their meeting for the first time, upon which an excited public welcomes them on a red carpet. Flashes of photographers' cameras suggest the figures are destined for stardom. Marchi's video installation sits nearby images of several fantastical paintings by Giorgio de Chirico or, or others in the uh, museum's collection, therefore, therefore establishes a dialogue with them. Likewise, David Stuckey's work, Mobile, Rome, a delicately balanced hanging sculpture made of wire coat hangers suspended from the ceiling immediately below a bare 100 watt light bulb, reverberates with photos of hanging objects owned by the museum and often in storage. And Sag Napoli's graffiti drawing, Am I Intuitive or Am I Paranoid, imprinted the question directly onto Silva's photo murals, featuring a work by Pino Pascali and another by Mario Schifano. Accordingly, Lopinto's project exhibition transforms the Museum of Contemporary Art of Rome into a performative space, a context in which new interventions with different spatial and temporal dimensions coexist. The show presents the public with a program of exhibition that is perpetually changing but coherent at the same time, a project that is comprehensible but not didactic. In the process, the museum becomes a shared infrastructure, a site for reciprocity and conviviality and experimentation, questioning the role of artistic production and reception. The museum's structure becomes elastic and interdisciplinary while providing space and context for artists to develop their thinking. What was previously a static exhibition site becomes a location of imaginative forms of cultural production. In the process, the museum works the museum moves away from its traditional role of hosting exhibitions to becoming an exhibition itself, to becoming a form and a place of active production. The organic transformation of the institution collapses the distance between the container and the contained. The polyphonic cultural center itself becomes the displayed content. To conclude then, project exhibitions and the critical perspectives and interventions they generate emerged from the concrete demands and social struggles that are increasingly concealed today in the reception of artistic practice. They do not simply illustrate or exhibit a theme, but instead generate a potential for new positions of speech, articulations, and cultural practices on the sidelines of dominant and habitual discourses. They also reflect on the protocols of the institutional framework in which they take place and probe that configuration's paradigms of depiction. In project exhibitions, a process usually dissociated from representation takes on central significance. The development of content, research, and display within a framework of artistic authorship. Accordingly, these exhibitions enable not only new publics, but also specifically related socialities. Unlike modernist curatorial approaches of the, 21st century, of the 20th century, which embrace the notion that art spaces and their related representational regimes are essentially neutral, project exhibitions provide their publics with tools to generate their own particular art interpretations. They develop transnational concerns while preserving critical aspects of local aesthetic conditions. And insofar as they situate artists, artworks, and artistic practices at the nexus between distinct visual languages, ways of thinking, and cultural logics, project exhibitions are full of potential for forward-looking museums in the 21st century. Thank you.